thank you to all of you and to everyone at the Institute for New Economic Thinking for asking me this morning to address such a distinguished international gathering. Um, I'm told that almost two thirds of today's audience comes from beyond the UK. So it is a real pleasure for me to welcome all of you here to Scotland. And uh, even although, like Adair, I am a West Coaster, uh, it's a particular pleasure to welcome you to our capital city, our beautiful capital city of Edinburgh. Now, I, of course, am biased. I think it's probably sensible to admit that up front this morning. But I think you have chosen the perfect location for this conference. <laughs> I know that although this is an institute that exists to promote new economic thinking, you have a deep respect and regard for the economic pioneers of the past. As Adair has just said, your first annual conference was held in the Cambridge College where John Maynard Keynes wrote his general theory. Your second was at Bretton Woods, of course, the site of the conference that did so much to shape the post-war global economy. So it is really fitting that for this conference, you have chosen the city which was the beating heart of the European Enlightenment, a city which has contributed hugely to the development of economic thought. It's not surprising that Adam Smith has already been mentioned several times this morning. Adam Smith, of course, was the founder of modern economic thinking. He lectured at Edinburgh in the 1750s, and then he lived and worked for the final years of his life at Panmuir House, which is just a mile or so away from here. You'll find a statue uh, to Adam Smith on Edinburgh's High Street. And of course, he's buried just uh, slightly further down the High Street in Canongate Kirkyard. Uh, so I know you've got a very busy agenda here. In fact, it made me quite tired when I read that I am one of just 85 speakers that you're going to hear from over the next three days. But if you do find the time or if you just want to escape for half an hour or so, um, I hope you'll get the opportunity to explore this beautiful city. And as part of that, perhaps uh, get to see Adam Smith's statue or, or even visit his grave. Uh, I have to tell you that Canongate Kirkyard is well worth a visit for anybody who has any interest in the history of this city. You will find many a famous name there. Uh, one of my own favourites is uh, the memorial stone in the Kirkyard uh, for Agnes McElhose. Uh, now, she was uh, one of the great loves of our national poet, Robert Burns, uh, and she was the woman uh, for whom Robert Burns wrote one of his most beautiful works, A Fond Kiss. Uh, so, no doubt I'll get into some trouble with the conference organisers if I encourage you too much to enjoy the pleasures of Edinburgh outside uh, the confines of the conference centre, but I hope you do get the opportunity uh, to enjoy some of what Edinburgh has to offer. Um, I know some of you uh, participated in a whisky reception last night, uh, so those of you who have uh, had the experience of enjoying one of our most famous exports uh, will already have found out that some of the famous Scottish hospitality is better enjoyed in moderation uh, if you want to be able to participate uh, properly in the work uh, of the conference. Now, obviously, the, the origins of the Institute for New Economic Thinking uh, lay in the financial crisis of 2007 and 2008. And I know that uh, one reason behind the setting up of this institute was a feeling that the crash resulted in part from shortcomings in modern economics and the work of economists. Now, uh, I should be very clear here, those shortcomings won't have belonged to any of the economists uh, in this room here. They, of course, were the shortcomings of other economists. Uh, it's also worth being clear that my party wasn't elected to government until 2007, so those shortcomings were not ours either. <laughs> all the responsibility of, of others. Uh, but my main focus today isn't really on the work of those other economists or politicians. Instead, I, I want to reflect a little bit on the wider issue of how your work relates to wider policymaking or how it should relate to wider policymaking. I know that's a subject that Lord Turner has uh, also raised in the past. Uh, and I'll also try to give you something of an insight into the economic thinking and approach of the Scottish Government. But it is probably appropriate to start with a reflection about the financial crisis. Because looking back, one of, I think, one of the most striking things about that crisis 
is that it occurred at a time when there actually was overwhelming policy consensus on certain key issues. For example, the question of risk dispersal across the financial system. And therefore, the crisis when it struck seemed to take governments and the wider establishment by surprise. And yet, when you look a bit closer and scratch the surface, that should not have been the case, because the consensus at the time didn't necessarily reflect academic opinion. Some very distinguished economists held dissenting views, but their voices didn't seem to carry any weight as economic thought was translated into public policy. And of course, that's an easier problem to diagnose in hindsight than it was at the time. But it is something that should be very uh, high in the minds of any modern politician as we seek to avoid uh, repeating in the future the mistakes of the past. You know, one of the famous, or I think it could be more accurately described as infamous uh, quotes of the EU referendum here in the UK last year was from a prominent Leave campaigner, now a member of the UK government, when he said, he thought that people had had enough of experts. Um, I think that's a, a quote that will haunt him for the rest, rest of his life. Uh, and of course, politics is about values and it's about judgments as much as it is about facts and figures. And I accept that and think that's as it should be. But I think the imperative for politicians today is not to think about how we listen less to the views of experts, I think the imperative and the challenge for modern politicians is how we open our thinking to a broader range of expert opinions, and in particular those opinions that challenge our view of the world, not just opinions that reaffirm our view of the world. And let's be frank about it, that at a very human level can be quite a challenging thing to do. Uh, politicians usually, although some of you might be sceptical about this, uh, but politicians usually have very clear and very strong principles and beliefs. Uh, and I think that's a strength. But it can mean, and this is the downside, that we're more likely to be swayed by the evidence that easily fits with our world view. And of course, if everybody seems signed up to the same world view, it makes decision making much more straightforward, much more simple. But the risk is that what develops is a, a group think and we blind ourselves to real risks and opinions that might alert us to those real risks. So it's never easy to reconcile diversity, disagreement and complexity with prompt decision making and clear communication but it is essential that we strive to do so because the financial crisis and the extent to which at large elements of policy making were out of kilter with reality in the run up to 2007 it provides overwhelming evidence of the need to listen to opinions as i said earlier that challenge our view of the world not just those that reinforce and reaffirm that view right, after all here in the uk and this will be true in uh, other parts of the world as well. We are still living today, 10 years on, with the consequences uh, of not uh, doing so in the years before the crash. Uh, just last week, the Office for Budget Responsibility here in the UK produced a report which set out the extent to which productivity in the UK has stalled during the last decade. And of course, uh, dissatisfaction with stagnating real wages and rising inequality, partly a result of low productivity, is widely seen and rightly seen as a factor in the political shocks we have witnessed in recent years, including Brexit here in the UK. Uh, now, I won't pretend for a, a second that the Scottish Government has all of the answers on this, uh, on how we properly use the full range of academic expertise to improve practical policy making while still being guided by principle and values. Uh, but I'll briefly set out some of the ways in which we are trying to at least engage with these issues. Um, I've been First Minister of Scotland since 2014, but as I mentioned earlier, uh, my party first came into government in 2007, uh, and for the early years of our government, I was the Deputy First Minister. Uh, and one of the early moves we made in 2007 was to establish a Council of Economic Advisers. Uh, the Council is international, it's diverse, and it is unquestionably expert. Uh, two of its current members, Professor Joseph Stiglitz and Professor Mariana uh, Mazzucuto, will participate in this conference, and Professor James Murley is another member I know has participated 
in the past. And it's important, in our view, that we have that range of expert opinion and advice to draw on. Uh, in Scotland, we face same challenges as other developed nations do. How we improve productivity, adapt to an ageing population, uh, make the transition to the low-carbon economy of the future, and ensure skilled and well-paid job opportunities in an age of automation. Uh, and of course, more particular to Scotland and the UK, Brexit, especially if we end up outside of the European single market, will cause serious harm to businesses and the overall economy in Scotland. So it is essential as we navigate those challenges that we draw on the best international advice that we can. And the Council of Economic Advisers has a real and significant influence on government thinking. Uh, the most recent example of that is our announcement last month uh, that the Scottish Government will establish a national investment bank in Scotland. Uh, and that decision drew on advice from the Council, which highlighted the role that investment banks already play in other European economies and, and highlighted that by providing patient capital, the bank could influence areas which are highly relevant to our productivity performance, support for new and growing businesses, investment in science, research and innovation. Uh, and yesterday we published a consultation seeking views on how an investment bank can best fulfil that role. Uh, the Council has also in the past provided us with detailed advice on the economic and social impact of one of our other key policy objectives, which is uh, dramatically expanding early years education uh, and childcare provision, looking at that from an economic perspective, not just a social perspective. Uh, it's currently assessing some of the issues that would be uh, associated with the potential for having different top rates of income tax in Scotland uh, compared to the rest of the UK, an issue which is very important now because the Scottish Government has more extensive tax and social security powers. So the advice we get from the Council is very clearly independent, but it is hugely valuable as a source of outside expertise as we make some pretty fundamental decisions about the direction of the country. And I think the existence of that council shows that if it is at all possible, uh, the Scottish Government wants to be engaged with relevant and at times challenging expert economist opinion. Uh, and for very similar reasons, just yesterday over in uh, the west of Scotland, uh, the Scottish Government convened an international conference on inclusive economic growth. Uh, that included experts from the OECD, the IMF, from a range of countries uh, as widespread as Costa Rica, New Zealand, Sweden, South Africa. Uh, as part of that conference, the, the Wellbeing Alliance met for the first time. And that's an alliance which is bringing together nations and regions. Scotland is playing a leading role in it, looking at how we use well-being and not just GDP as a measure of our economic performance. And this issue of inclusive growth is central to our economic thinking here in Scotland. Uh, when we published our new economic strategy uh, two years ago, uh, we included in that a major focus on addressing inequality uh, through a range of measures, tackling poverty, supporting skills, promoting gender equality. Uh, and at the time, Professor Stiglitz said that tackling inequality is the foremost challenge that many governments face. And Scotland's economic strategy leads the way in identifying these challenges and provides a strong vision for change. So we see that focus on inclusion as being an essential part of having an innovative, open economy. Uh, and firstly, and, and this is demonstrated by the political shocks I referred to earlier, we must build a fairer and a more inclusive society if we're going to sustain popular support for a dynamic, open and competitive economy. Uh, but in addition to that, we know now from a wealth of evidence that inequality actually undermines our efforts to increase productivity and to prosper through uh, innovation and internationalisation. Uh, and we do have that wealth of evidence now. Uh, we know that inequality is not simply a price that has to be paid for economic growth. Uh, we know that it hampers and constrains economic growth. Uh, the OECD estimates that between 1990 and 2010, income inequality in the UK reduced economic output per head by nine percentage points. Now to put that in context, 
That amounts to £1,600 for every person in the UK. We've got to act on that evidence, uh, just as we have to act on the evidence of other forms of inequality that are not just morally wrong, but also economically damaging. An issue very close to my heart is, is gender inequality. Again, we know from the evidence, again, I'm citing OECD research here, that if women participated in the workforce at the same rate as men, uh, the output of uh, OECD countries over the next 20 years would be 12% higher. So this is hard evidence now that we must act on. And in Scotland, we've got a range of policies to try to boost innovation, increase our uh, international exports, uh, increase our productivity. But we know all of that will be weakened if inequality is too high. Uh, apart from anything else, we know that many people who could be the researchers, the engineers, the entrepreneurs of the future uh, will not get a fair chance if we allow income inequality, uh, gender inequality to prevail. We need to have an approach to building an economy that allows everyone to contribute their talent, their ideas and their energies. Uh, and inclusive growth, I guess, is linked to the final point uh, I want to make this morning. You know, when I was looking through your conference programme for the next uh, few days, uh, I was struck by just how relevant the issues you are discussing uh, are. Gender equality, the media, immigration, intergenerational issues, uh, and perhaps a bit more alarmingly, past democratic collapses. Uh, but it's clear from that agenda that this is a conference that is deeply engaged, as it has to be, with wider social issues. And that actually is another factor that links you to the legacy of Adam Smith. Uh, someone, I have to say, whose legacy is not always well served by some of his uh, ultra free market supporters. Uh, Adam Smith's economic science was rooted in a clear vision of society. He knew that although self-interest will motivate people, sympathy, empathy, concern for others is also a defining characteristic of being human. And as he famously argued in The Wealth of Nations, no society can be flourishing or happy of which the greater part of the members are poor and miserable. Adam Smith knew that ultimately the major choices we make in economic policy aren't just about what kind of economy we want to create, they are about what kind of society we want to live in. Ultimately, economic policy is a means to an end. It's the means by which we enable people or don't enable people to live happy, healthy, fulfilling lives. So in Scotland, we are trying to tackle these big economic issues in the right way as we build not just a stronger economy, but a better and a fairer society. Uh, but we know as we do that, we have a huge amount to learn from expert analysis and international perspectives. Uh, that's why we have the Council of Economic Advisors. It's why we welcome events like the one I spoke about yesterday. Uh, but it is why we are so delighted that this conference has taken place in Edinburgh. It's a gathering which is undoubtedly in the best traditions of Scotland's past, but a gathering which I hope will also deliver some of the fresh thinking that we need as we look to the future. Uh, Lord Turner said that we want Scotland to be an open, outward-looking economy, and that's the point I, I want to, as I finish, emphasise. Uh, one of the frustrating things for me in the EU referendum, one of the many frustrating things, was how much that debate was driven by opposition to immigration. So we ended up taking a, a decision to leave the European Union to try to restrict something, immigration, that actually we need more of in order to thrive uh, as an economy, or we need uh, continuation of to thrive as an economy. Uh, so being open, outward looking, recognising that we need to use the best and the brightest brains and talents from across the world is fundamental to our approach, not just to what we do here in Scotland, but to the contribution that we as Scotland make to the world. So I wish you a wonderful time here in Edinburgh, uh, and I wish you uh, well for the remaining, what is now uh, the remaining 83 speeches of this conference. Uh, good luck and enjoy.